Hello, students, and we are live. Welcome to Workbase Webinar Wednesday. Um, once again, I have some of my professional friends with me. Um, you know, students, as always, I want you to follow the three L's as we are uh, having this broadcast and we're having our conversation. The three L's are look, listen, and learn. So if you're looking and you're watching this video, um, just make sure that you have your listening ears on. And if you have your listening ears on, you are guaranteed to learn something. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to ask my guests to introduce themselves and then we'll we'll get into the interview portion of it. So uh, ladies first. OK. All right. Well, uh, hello, everyone. My name is Janice Blackman Davis. I am a LCMHC. Uh, that's a lot to take in because they just changed it on us. You will find out going in this field that there's a lot of changes, uh, but it's a lot of good changes. So basically I'm a, a licensed professional counselor. Uh, I've been in the field since 2010. I have different specialties areas of uh, marriage and family, substance abuse, uh, trauma focus, where I work with children who have experienced trauma, I work with parents for triple P. Uh, I love what I do. Right now I'm in outpatient care. So I am an independent practitioner, self-employed, meaning I contract my services. I see all ages. I see, uh, I think the youngest that I've seen is probably about four. And the oldest that I've seen, uh, I think they were in their 70s. Um, so I see all age ranges. I see, uh, I die, I, I see people with, uh, different diagnoses, uh, children with ADHD, some behavioral issues, uh, adults and children with depression, anxiety, and different things like that. So that's just a little bit um, about myself as we go on through this. So you'll find out more about me and what I do. Okay, Brandon. Well, um, I almost hate to follow that up because uh, Shanice pretty much has all the same credentials as I do and the same areas of interest as I do. Um, but my name is Brandon. I'm Allison. I work as a licensed clinical mental health counselor as well. Um, I've had, I've been in the mental health field for since 2010. So I have 10 years of mental health experience. Um, I've been working as a counselor for the past four years. Um, my concentration sort of started working with at-risk youth, uh, working in our juvenile justice system, um, in several counties throughout North Carolina, um, including Guilford County, Forsyth. Um, and a little bit of Orange and Alamance County as well. Um, so that's kind of how I got started in mental health, working with at-risk youth, doing a lot of in-home, intensive in-home family work. And that kind of prompted me to want to get some additional education um, and work with families on a more one-on-one -on -one basis or maybe um, outside of their homes um, and doing one-on-one -on -one counseling or family counseling. Um, I have a passion for couples as well as family work. Um, I do individual and independent contract work as well. And I also work for the healthcare system um, here in Charlotte doing some um, employee assistance work with adults um, as well as dependents between the ages of eight and 26. So I'm looking forward to this. Um, I'm glad uh, to be doing and presenting on something that I'm very passionate about. And uh, sort of how Shanice said, I look forward to sharing some more things about me that you guys can take and um, apply to your own high school career. Awesome, awesome, awesome. So uh, what a great segue into our first question. I want you guys to talk to us about why you chose your career path and who or what was your inspiration or your motivation to go into the career field of uh, mental health and counseling? You want to go first? I'll go first. It doesn't matter. Uh, I don't, uh, probably my motivation, like, well, first, just let me say, like, when I went to college, I did not go for this. Uh, I went in going, my major was nursing. Uh, I went in knowing I had a plan, sure enough plan, BSN, then I was going to do nurse practitioner. Um, because I've always, you know, growing up, my dad was a social worker and he still is. He'll be retiring next year. Uh, he'll have 30 years under his belt. Um, being a social worker in Cabarrus County. Um, and he was a minister while I was growing up. So I was watching him serve people. Like he was mm. constantly serving people. Mm. And, and I knew that was inside of me as well. Um, just that humanitarian uh, spirit. 
And so I knew that whatever I did and whatever field I went into, that I, it, it was going to be to be a service. Um, so when I went into school, I thought, OK, well, I definitely want to help people. So maybe that's just the nursing field for me. So I went in with a major um, in uh, nursing and then a minor in psychology, but quickly found out that I needed to change that. Um, and so, and really I can credit that to my dad. He was that foundation that laid, that was laid for me, but then also just hooking up with my academic advisors, um, and really being open and raw with them about my passion and the classes that, I, that I enjoy, um, and them actually moving me into that direction because I really didn't know a lot about mental health. Like when we were in school, it was not talked about as much as it's talked about now. Um, we didn't see therapists coming into our schools, right? To see other kids. We didn't hear other kids saying that they had a therapist um, or adults. We didn't hear our family saying that they were going to therapy. So I really did not know that that was an avenue that I could actually go into and explore. And so once my academic advisor opened that up for me, that was motivation to just go full throttle into that. So. Awesome. What about you, Brandon? Um, you know, same. Uh, Shanice and I are from, the, are from the same hometown. I've known her for a long time. And so uh, the landscape in our community was definitely not geared towards mental health. Um, I would say that um, a big motivation for me, I think I came from a family um, of givers um, who have worked in the healthcare or giving um, in the helping profession, I think pretty much all my life, whether that's personal care aides, uh, nurses. Um, I have some family who have worked um, at the Department of Social Services as well, doing social work or community outreach. So I, I feel like that was always kind of in my in my background also. And I would say the biggest transition for me was probably when I went to college. Um, I went to Winston-Salem State University and I uh, joined Alpha Phi Alpha fraternity um, in the spring of 2007. And we did a lot of programs and mentorships with Big Brother, Big Sister. We had a lot of community outreach and engagement programs, um, such as go to high school, go to college, and did a lot of work at your more, um, I guess you could say, at-risk schools um, in Forsyth County. Um, a lot of Title I schools who receive certain assistance and certain funding uh, because of the numbers and the, the, the population um, that they serve um, in the communities that they reside in. So I think seeing a lot of those young men and, and, and children um, just realizing, you know, you don't realize what they bring into the schools with them and that they are truly a product of the environments that they're coming from, which impacts how they learn how they understand information, how they even respond or not respond to their teachers. And that led me to work in the school system briefly doing some behavioral modification work um, in Guilford County. And what I realized is that a lot of these teachers are not very uh, what's the, culturally sensitive um, to mm -hmm. a lot of individuals who look like me. And that mm -hmm. led me to just say, I want to work with them because I feel like I understand what they're saying. Or at least that's what I thought at what, 22 or 23. And that just, I think, really ignited a passion within me to work with students. And then once I started working with students, I was like, man, I need to talk to your mom. I need to talk to your dad. You know, I need to talk to grandma. I need to talk like I needed to reach beyond the students so that we could have more wraparound, a wraparound approach, if you will, um, to really reach and connect. And that ignited another passion in me that said there, there's I'm on to something here. Like I was good at building rapport um, and working with those students and families. And I said, mental health you know it just kind of clicked for me i guess in that regard having not heard it much myself in school there were things that were starting to kind of take off some unfortunate incidents that happened across our country that i think started to sort of let the world know that mental health is very much real um that the stigma shouldn't continue to be ignored and i wanted to be a face that was i guess that resembled a lot of the people who I've seen struggling, who didn't know about these services or how to access them. And I think that really pushed me to, to get into it. Yeah. And that's a, what, what, what awesome stories from both of you. Um, and Brandon, you went to probably one of the greatest universities, you know, ever. Went to Seven State University. It's okay to say the State <laughs> University, the greatest. But um, All right. you know, I want to say you, you truly, um, Followed our motto, to learn, depart, to serve. Absolutely. And so um, 
I just that's all I kept hearing from the both of you service. You know, I wanted to serve. I wanted to serve. And so students, this may be a career field for you if you have a heart of servitude, if you like helping others. So um, I really appreciate um, what you guys are saying and what you guys are doing. So um, that leads me to my next question. What are <clears throat> um, the skill sets needed in this career field to be successful um, as far as your, your soft skills that you may need and some of your hard skills? Um, I would say for me, um, you have to have a passion to work in this in this profession um, because to be transparent, burnout can be very real because you're giving of yourself. Uh, you're pouring out a lot of emotions. You get emotionally connected to a lot of different stories, a lot of different people um, who come from a, maybe even a similar background um, or just maybe uh, people that you identify with because you've met them somewhere else with other clients. There's always connecting stories um, or, or situations in, in mental health, if you will. And uh, you have to have passion, like because it, you have to reignite your purpose in this field, I think regularly, because it is a very demanding uh, position to be in because people trust you, you know, to, to talk about what's going on in their life from their childhood to adulthood. You know, I've worked with as old as 75 and as young as seven or eight, um, you know, and so that's, a, that's across the lifespan when you really look at the impact that your life can have on your worldview. Um, whether that be socially, socially, excuse me, emotionally and spiritually, physically, all of these things are impacted by that. So you definitely have to have passion. Um, I think you also have to have a willingness um, to help um, other people. You have to have a willingness to want to meet people where they are, no matter what their circumstances uh, may be. Something brought them to you and or brought you to them. I do believe in the power of that connectedness um, when I meet any client that I've ever had, there's a purpose that we have crossed paths on this day at this time. And I take that, you know, very, very seriously in terms of having that that willingness. Um, I think you also have to sort of have a plan for yourself because um, you can, you know, get into this field. But what's your what's your plan? What do you want to do with your skill set? Uh, being able to be entrusted with people. What do you want to do with this passion? Because it's a huge field to kind of be in because there's so many different areas. What's your area of specialty? What groups of people may you want to help or, or be assistive to in terms of utilizing that skill set? So you have to have a plan. Um, it is not a get rich uh, uh, field to be in. I'm gonna tell you the honest truth, but it's very rich in uh, other things, maybe not finance, but it's very rewarding to see people get it or people who thank you because they will because you're really working with them and creating a very personal relationship. So that internal feeling is probably worth more than anything I've ever earned um, in terms of finance. Um, and so you really have to have a plan to know what it is that you want to do um, to be successful on on both sides of that fence. Awesome. Uh, so yeah, um, basically, like, uh, as far as like skills, you know, uh, I do want to talk about certain like hard skills, right? The 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 uh, writing, uh, being able to you know be at the, use computer program. Like a lot of people uh, think when they hear the word therapist, right? They think, okay, there's there's this therapist behind a desk, and then there's there's a couch, and a client and patient comes in, and the client and patient lays on the couch, and one quick word of the therapist, life is different and life is great. And you see all these unicorns and balloons and cupcakes and all that. And that ain't the case. Um, that's not the case. I don't have a couch. Now don't feel up. I have a couch at home. So don't say I ain't gonna be a therapist because I can't afford a couch. I don't have a couch in an office, but I sure do have a computer that goes, seems to follow me everywhere I go. Um, and I have to, we have something when a client, a patient comes into us for the first time, we have to do a whole intake, right? That involves a clinical assessment that involves paperwork, signing authorizations that involves, right? Like we have to do certain, uh, 
uh, rating scales, measurements to see, uh, you know, about a diagnosis. We have to do a lot of different things. Um, and so you have to have some kind of knowledge with computers. Um, you have to have, you have to want to uh, write and type because every time I see a client, look, every time I see a client, I have to do what is called a clinical note uh, after that client. If I don't do a clinical note for that client, guess what? It's almost like I've never seen that client before. Uh, if I saw that client on Monday and my note is not in, I never saw that client on Monday. Um, so you're going to have to have and want, now I'm not saying you're gonna like it like it because I don't know, uh, Brandon can probably agree with me. Sitting at the computer and doing notes all the time is really no fun. Um, I love to be in front of the client. I love to do therapy. I love it. Uh, but the notes, ooh, uh, those notes. And but you have to, um, you have to. It, it comes with it. It comes with the job. Um, and so I would say that. I would say that um, another skill that has I've had to level up on that skill since COVID is adaptability, right? Um, I'm not used to sitting behind a, a computer screen and doing Zoom virtual therapy. I'm used to my client coming to my office. I'm used to going to the school. I'm used to uh, going to the homes. I'm used to that face-to-face -face, um, contact, but I had to switch up some things because of COVID, but it's teaching me to get better at those skills. Uh, that everything is not going to be the same. Things are constantly changing. And so you have to take what you have and make it work and still be able to serve the clients to your best ability. Um, just because COVID hit doesn't mean we stopped serving our mm -hmm. clients. We've actually gotten more referrals because there's a lot of um, people coming in with depression and anxiety because of the way the world is right now, the state that we are in. So it doesn't stop. So we have to get creative. Uh, communication is a good thing because I'm not just communicating when a client comes into my office for the first time. I'm just not communicating with that client. Probably I'm communicating with different stakeholders and stakeholders. That's like insurance people that I'm having to talk to as far as billing. I'm having to talk to maybe social workers that that person is dealing with, different other support, uh, support that that client, that patient is also connected to that I have to communicate with them as well for the overall well-being of the client. So I have to I have to be good in communication skills, right? So I would say communication skills is a, um, a big thing, a skill that you need to. Absolutely. I absolutely agree. Um, with the communication skills and communication skills will help you in any career field um student you just have to learn how to be an an effective communicator and um everyone doesn't receive your message the same way so you're going to have to learn different tones and different ways of communicating with others um yeah. so that they will understand you um so you know you you pretty much just have to meet people where they are so students, if you didn't hear anything, I, I want you to take that. I love that communication skills. Um, you can use that in any career field, but especially um, in the counseling um, and mental health career field. Uh, and one of the most important communication skills y'all might not is listening. Yes. <laughs> y'all think <laughs> y'all agree or not? Um, yeah. I think, I think it's, it's listening. Um, and listening to to hear what others are saying, it, it can really make and break a relationship that you have. Um, you know, uh, I've worked with other therapists, and they might have came in with a good reputation, but right now their reputation is not as good because those communication skills are not there. And you know, uh, my you know my dad always taught me. He said, you know, he always used to say to me. Everybody doesn't need to know you're right all the time. Let it just be you knowing that. Mm -hmm. um, so sometimes you're going to have to communicate with people in, in every field, but just talking about the mental health field, I've had to communicate with different stakeholders and different other people. And I might not have agreed with their stance, but it was my approach, um, you know, in communication that actually saved 
and salvage that relationship. And we were actually able to get to the ultimate goal um, that we were all trying to get to. And so communication is is key, you know, to anything, because if you're not able to communicate, you're not able to, um, you know, uh, talk to people in a way of, OK, there's a there's an ultimate goal. And, you know, I might have my own opinions, but it's my approach and how I how I get that out. You know, it can make or break. It, it really could make or break things for you. I just want to add to that. I um, I don't know how much I've learned. Uh, in this field, whether that's in even prior to that in high school, middle school, uh, college, I don't know how much I learned by actually opening my mouth. Um, I think everything that I've learned and been able to pay attention to is because I was listening. Um, and I consider myself to be a very uh, observant person. Um, and when you're in the room, that's how you're going to learn the most. And um, like you said, uh, Dominique, I think as it relates to any field, if you're in the room, you should be listening. Because that's how you're going to soak in information. Um, I'm, I was old school in terms of how I was raised. And my mom was real good to say, you know, you can't talk and listen at the same time. Your brain just doesn't work that way. Well, you, you might think that it does. Um, but if you're talking while I'm talking, you're not listening. Your ears are not focused in on absorbing information. You're focused on responding to what I'm talking about. And so listening in the room and being able to understand those social skills um, and being able to understand what people say, even without saying it, uh, body language, uh, those, those, those nonverbal communication skills are just as equally as important as what's coming out of someone's mouth and being able to use your ears. Absolutely. Yeah. And this is great. Uh, this is awesome information. Um, great gems of knowledge for our students. I, and I really appreciate it. The mental health field is just as important as physical health. So in my eyes, you guys are like, you know, doctors. You are you are doctors in my eyes. So really appreciate what you do. I got one last question for y'all. So if you can go back to your high school days or middle school days as a teenager, what advice would you give your teenage self? What would you say to yourself? Oh, um, you know what? I'm I'm going to stick with listening. I think I missed some stuff. Um, I'm going to be honest. I, she is probably laughing because she knew me um, in the school. And I was, I, I won't say class clown, but I enjoyed having a good time in school. Now, let me say on the flip side of that, I was very much a nerd on the backside. And I mean yes, that in a good way. Um, I, I love to read. I spent time in the library. I did my work. I was not a disruption, at least in my mind anyway, to class. Um, but I know I think I, I probably missed some things that I wasn't listening to that maybe older teachers, because we had older teachers. Um, I think when I was coming through, like teachers who taught my mom, like my mm -hmm. second grade teacher was my mom's first grade teacher. That's the yeah. kind of community that we you know come from. And so I think there were some jewels, especially as I got to middle school and high school, that because, I mean, I was a teenager, you know, so there's going to be some defiance or as you're coming into your own, you think you know. Before they even speak, you think you know. Mm -hmm. And if I could go back, I would tell young Brandon to listen more um, because I think I might have missed some things that could have even enriched my college experience. And even as a young adult and now having a family of my own, um, and not just to my teachers, but I mean the whole community. I think I would have listened a lot more to my aunts, my uncles, people who were passing nuggets of information that I couldn't see because I didn't have life experience. I was just living. You know, I was a teenager. Everything was possible. Oh, no, that doesn't make sense, you know, because you're old. And when I say old, I was telling people who were 35, like, you're old. And now that I'm getting closer to that, I'm like, nah, that's like super young, actually. Um, but these people have life experience I don't have, whether it's 10 years older than me or 15 or 30. They have life experience. And I think there are some things that could have made life a little bit easier for me in some ways, because I don't remember every single piece of information that was given to me. But I know there were some moments where I was doing way more talking than listening. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think mine would have to be. Um, and I know this sounds like cliche. Um, because a lot of people say it, 
um, but I'm here to like dot the I and cross the T to confirm that this is true, that time waits on no one. Um, I remember being, I remember about to finish up uh, my undergrad degree and I had applied to different schools for my master's program, got into a couple schools, but I was still on the fence about, should I do it? Should I not do it? And I was in conversation with my dad and he said, um, he said, are you going to go? Have you picked what school you're going to go to? And I said, I think I'm going to wait. And he said, for what? And I said, because I'm tired. He's like, tired of what? And it kind of like threw me back. Like, I'm like, has this man not been, you know, with me for the past four years? He not understand my tiredness. I've been, you know, busting my tail to, you know, uh, do this uh, work and complete this and graduate. But he said, he said, look, he said, you got a choice. He said, in a year from now, you can tell somebody in conversation that you're just starting or you can tell them you're halfway done. What do you want? What do you want to say when you're in that conversation? And I said, well, I want to say I'm halfway done. And he said, then you need to go. He said, because no matter the time, the time's going to go. And it, whether you choose to do something or not. Right. Um, so every dream, you know, you guys probably have so many dreams, so many goals. Um, go after those. Um, your goals and your dreams, like if I could tell my younger self now, uh, man, go, every dream and every goal, that needs to be something that you go to sleep thinking about and you wake up thinking about. Um, that should be your baby right there. Like literally, uh, you know, you guys are all at an age right now where you're dating and uh, probably not supposed to be getting serious with any, uh, anybody, but you know, you have your girlfriends and your boyfriends, but your dream and your passion and your goals should be your boyfriend and your girlfriend. Like the other person uh, should be like, you know, there, but you know, on the side. Mm -hmm. We call them side piece. Uh, probably gonna get trouble for that. <laughs> uh, but don't laugh at me too much. But literally, um, your dreams and your goals, go after them. And you know, and like Brandon said, the older people that are trying to instill those nuggets, that's wisdom. Um, you know, I'm great. Uh, some things I didn't listen to, but the things that I did uh, listen to, I'm grateful for it because had I not, I look at other people, Brandon said, we're from the same city, Kannapolis, Ale Brown Wonders. Um, and him, he can agree with me where there's a lot of people that we went to school with that they're still in a stuck position. They had dreams and they had goals just like we had. Um, but the difference is dreams don't work unless you do. You know, I can say every day that I have a dream and I have this goal, but if I don't get up and I don't move with time, then time's going to pass me by. Time's always going to be moving, but you have to move with it. Um, so I think that's what I would tell myself, you know, don't get so caught up in the things, you know, now look towards that future, look towards those goals. And, you know, and if that, those people beside you, those friends and those boyfriend and those girlfriends, if they really truly see who you are, they'll be, they'll have your back um, in you completing those goals and those dreams. I love it. I love it. So um, another nugget that I want to give your students is always take copious notes. So during this whole uh, recording, I might have been looking down at my phone, but I was taking I was taking notes. Um, so take copious notes all the time. It doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter what you're doing. Like Brandon said, you can listen and you can learn something. Um, I'm, my parents always say you got two ears, and you got one mouth and you got those two ears for a reason. Um, mm -hmm. so you need to be listening more than you're talking. So. Um, here's some of my notes that I just want to wrap up with for you students to some takeaways. Um, so in order to be successful in this career field, you need to have a willingness to be a servant. Um, you need to have a passion for helping others and you need to specialize and master your skill set. <clears throat> and this is a, this is a selfless career field. Um, so you have to put yourself to the side a lot of times and really focus on others and, and the benefit of others and not so much on 
how you're going to benefit, even when it comes to the financial part of, of how much you're getting paid for what you're doing. And last but not least, you need to be adaptable and flexible in order to be successful in this career field. Um, guys, if you don't have anything else, uh, that's our work-based webinar Wednesday. Y'all good? Well, I appreciate you uh, allowing us to speak today. Um, and man, I mean, I was just thinking, I wish like literally that we would have had something like this. I don't ever remember us having anything like this when we were in high school. And if we would have had this, you know, it definitely would have allowed us to get further. You know, we wouldn't have to learn so much independently on our own. And that's what you want. You want people to instill knowledge in you so that you don't have to um, learn it independently. You can go further. Um, you know, you don't have to take as much time out. And if we would have had some of this, man, how awesome it would have been. So guys, you know, I encourage you guys to take it all in as much mm -hmm. as you can. So thank you so much, uh, Dominique, for inviting us uh, yeah. to come and do this. Oh, no, thank you all for doing what you do. Um, yep. So that just means that we need to have a round two. We need to come up with another topic. Yes, we do. <laughs> please let That'd me know. Great. Please let me know. I'll be glad to come back anytime. I agree with everything Shanice just said. I can't even add anything to that. It was perfect. Just please take it all in, really. Take mm -hmm. advantage of it. On that note, that's our work-based webinar Wednesday. We're signing off. Thank you for tuning in, and we'll see you next time. All right. Bye-bye. Thank you.